probably the, uh, the male. I count four shell casings on the floor. The blood splatter, if we go down now, let's go back down to the, the victim's head here. This appears to be an entrance wound. What's very unusual about this entrance wound, the revolver is here. It would have been very difficult for him to take the gun, point it over on this side of the head, and fire it, and then pick up the gun and put it back here. It appears to be planted. This appears to be some foul play, possibly drug-related. If we look over here, there's a pooling effect of blood. It may not appear to be blood on the camera, but that's what it's meant to appear, this uh, dark coloration on the white surface. It trails out this direction. And if we can see, I'm going to step over the body. If I point down here, this is the pulling effect. As we work our way out this way, we see blood splatter. And as you see the blood in the large pool, so larger coagulation right here, where it narrows, that is called the splatter pattern. That means that this blood came from this direction that way. There was possibly a struggle that took place here, and the person who committed this crime may have been injured in, in an assault. Uh, there might have been a, a fight that ensued. So it's going to be very important to collect that blood for DNA purposes later. And uh, another, another idea, if we thought that there was a question as to whether or not this individual actually committed a part of the crime, maybe, he sh maybe there was a group effort here. He shot his girlfriend, or we find out later that it's his wife. He gets into a struggle with the other boyfriend, and uh, subsequently he ends up getting shot. Possibly he fired this weapon. So Glenn, at the front table, has an atomic absorption kit, which he could explain uh, to you in the next minute or so, which will tell you what we can do to see if this weapon has actually been fired by this individual. Well, you know, Steve, that's a, that's a good idea. We'll return back. Hi. We'll, we're going to return back here to Crime Scene Central, and Glenn will e explain this uh, kit to us. But l you know what? Let me just take this call from... Hi, Lorraine. Hi. How are you? Good. Um, you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, I just was wondering how uh, important the amount of time that goes by between the time that the local police discover the, the crime scene and the time that the prosecutor's office gets there. And I was also wondering if there's ever been a case where local police have contaminated a crime scene before the prosecutor's office was able to get there. Good. Two very good questions. Um, Glenn, why don't you handle it? How, how important is time? In, in well, obviously, the faster we can get there, the better. Um, we try, obviously, to respond in a rapid, safe way. Uh, I would say, on an average, it, by the time the first officer responds to the scene and makes the notifications within his own department, uh, and then uh, my office is notified, and then we're actually notified and be able to respond to a scene, probably the most rapid we could be there would be an hour. Um, after the scene is found, which sounds like a lot of time, but in fact it really isn't. Um, an hour is, within an hour is, is pretty rapid, uh, especially since these crimes usually happen uh, in the early morning hours, 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, as far as the contamination uh, goes, uh, the local officers, uh, they're kind of in a bad situation, for, especially the first responding officer, because uh, he has to enter the crime scene, he has to find out that he has a crime scene, uh, he has to make sure uh, that the victim is either alive or dead. Obviously, his first responsibility is for preservation of life. Uh, if he thinks a person is alive, then he has to take the appropriate action. Uh, if the person is obviously dead, he still has to check uh, to see if there's any other victims in a residence. So we're talking about a house. Uh, also, see if the perpetrator is still there, uh, if the person who committed this crime is still there. So by those acts itself, uh, he has to, in a sense... Uh, if you want to say there is, could be some contamination uh, to the crime scene, but these are things that have to be done. Uh, after that's done, then the crime scene is secured, uh, and then their responsibility is to keep everybody out of the crime scene so no further contamination occurs. Uh, Lorraine, does that basically answer your question? Yeah. yeah. I, I think uh, also, as Glenn mentioned and as Steve was speaking of, not only does the 
perpetrator or the accused either take something from or leave something at the crime scene. Anybody who comes in there takes or leaves something in the crime scene, be it fibers, uh, secretions, anything. So we uh, go through a lot of uh, uh, a lot of pains to train our young officers. Um, interestingly enough, yesterday, uh, yesterday and the day before, we just hired a few officers and we do some training with them before they actually head out to the police academy. And uh, and I took them through part of that evidence gathering um, uh, scenario and explaining to them the same thing. Would they do have a responsibility to, to preserve life? Uh, and once they are sure that that is, then they want to back out to where they came in and, and pretty much seal it off. Everything from even using the phone at the crime scene to call headquarters, they're advised that how dangerous that is. And that's, and I think you realize for obvious reasons, not only might there be fingerprints on the phone, but the last call that was made from that phone can be traced, uh, et cetera, et cetera, as long as you don't interfere with, uh, with that in between. So those are things that we maybe see on TV all the time and we have to make absolutely sure we impart to uh, the officers that we deal with. Um, I think in Monmouth County we, pro we have a very high rate of success with the sterility, I guess, of crime scenes once, uh, once they're discovered. So uh, I'd like to think we do a good job. I hope you think so, too. Thanks. Thanks for your call. I appreciate it. Um, we were just about to talk about atomic absorption. And um, we can show this to probably any camera your little heart desires. Uh, probably that one. Good. This is, uh, this is the kit that we use. It, uh, it's uh, made by many different companies. This happens to be made by a company called Searchy. Um, and inside the kit are a pair of gloves and also some uh, plastic vials and a small vial with nitric 5% uh, solution nitric acid. And what uh, the detectives would do with this kit is if there's uh, a person who is suspect of firing a weapon, uh, the person uh, is secured by uh, police officers who, uh, who arrested him. We'll bring him into headquarters. Uh, we will take these swabs, and they're marked for uh, a cartridge case uh, if you find one. There's one for control so that uh, you just put the nitric acid on it, seal it back up. And then there's different areas of the hands that are swabbed. Uh, these swabs with the nitric acid uh, are then put back into containers, and they're set off, uh, sent off to... Uh, either the FBI or other agencies that can test them, and they are able to come back uh, with a report and tell us if uh, there's a high probability that somebody or that this person that was tested uh, did fire a weapon, a handgun in particular in this case. Now, anybody who actually fired in our crime scene here, there is a question as to whether the victim that has the weapon in his hand uh, may have even fired a weapon at all, and there's some doubt that he fired a weapon at a, that caused his demise. So that would be a good way to not only um, uh, confirm that maybe he fired a weapon, but also if we think he didn't, that would also help us to confirm that, yes? That's correct, as long as we can get the test done, yes. Yeah. How long does the test like that take? Long? It, well, it, de it depends. Actually, to do the test on our end, it takes uh, a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. Uh, to have it uh, sent out and then have it uh, taken care of and then get results back depends upon how backed up the lab is. Usually four to six weeks we would get results back. Okay. Well, why don't we shoot back over to... Uh, shoot back. Why don't we uh, go back over to Steve, who's uh, now uh, still at the crime scene. Hi, Steve. Hello. And, and while uh, Glenn was busy telling you about the absorption, atomic absorption kit, if you look down to the right, uh, we've been busy with the video camera, the 35 millimeter camera with a flash unit, quantum battery, and next to it is a Polaroid camera. Uh, where the Polaroid camera, which is the furthest to the right, comes, comes to use is we take Polaroids of the scene. We take those Polaroids and we give those to the detectives that are outside the crime scene so they can get a visual idea of what's taking place without actually having to enter the crime scene, which certainly uh, aids us in keeping out uh, personnel that could contaminate the scene. 
And also, later on, the medical examiner is going to want pictures depicting the scene to help him make an evaluated and educated guess as to what the cause and manner of death was. And those Polaroids certainly help. Uh, they're instamatic. You don't have to wait to get them developed. Now, if you bring the camera back over to me, I brought with me a few enlargements on core board, and I'm going to show you some of the different techniques that we would utilize. Um, first off, this is a latent footwear lifter. At the last show, we talked about fingerprints. The lifter is a lot smaller than this. This can actually lift a footprint off the ground. And in this particular instance, the, the floor, we saw a few uh, footwear impressions when we came in. So we took photographs of those and we labeled them. Now we're going to make the lift. I would peel this plastic sheath off this rubber lifter, and I'm going to show you what the finished product would look like. This is after a successful lift. They are very difficult to obtain, but yet, if you look at the impression, uh, it appears that the word Dexter is written here. You could almost count the number of ridges in the shoe, and this can be used as a comparison later on if you do develop a suspect. Of course, the first thing we would do is rule out uh, either one of the victims is wearing these shoes, and also the first officer on scene and any medical personnel that would have come, try to rule them out. So this actually is uh, picturesque. It's very hard, to, very difficult to get something just like this. From looking at that, that impression, can you make any generalizations about the, uh, the person who might have left that lift? Maybe that they were maybe a large man with a well, certainly that, corduroy jacket? Or? Right. Just looking at this briefly, we're talking about a size 11 and a half. So we're talking about a large individual. And these, I made some enlargements of impressions, footwear impressions, and also a palm or hand that would have been left in blood. Um, we didn't show it today, but typically uh, this, this could be in a, in a crime scene that involved a lot of blood, um, similar to the one out in California. Here, again, if we can get a, a close-up view, we can actually find uh, ridge endings, and uh, we have the ability to classify this hand. We find the potential actor, again, ruling out everybody that came into the crime scene. If we find a suspect, we could possibly, good chance, make an identification off this individual. And again, the footwear, you could, this really stands out. You see the uh, diagonal designs. This would be probably a lot easier than the other footwear impression that I showed you. Again, if we, if we break from uh, me and we go over to Glenn, he could give you a brief overview of what I'm talking about when we talk about the, the hand and the ridge details that we came upon. Yeah, Glenn, you have a, uh, basically an APHIS hit uh, sheet there. Maybe you could explain a tiny bit about that. Yeah, in the beginning of the show, you had uh, mentioned, uh, made mention of APHIS, and what that is is the automated fingerprint identification system um, that is uh, housed within the New Jersey State Police in West Trenton. And what that does, that allows us to compare the latent fingerprints. These are the prints that we find with powders, uh, and like Steve uh, just pointed out, also possibly in blood or other items. Um, then we submit these, they put them in a computer, the computer runs them through all the latent print cards that are in the system, and then if you're lucky, like in this case, uh, if you're very fortunate that uh, the latent comes back, the computer tells you that it matches up with an individual, then the latent, which is the picture right here on your screen, which is the uh, actual lift found at the scene, they match it up with the picture on the other side, which is the finger the computer believes uh, is from the suspect, from their inked fingerprint card. Uh, then we have to bring it back, and as fingerprint experts, we have to actually sit down and visually match up the minutia, which are the points of comparison. And once that's done and we are confident that it's a hit, then we can react to this and arrest the suspect or uh, have further charges uh, against the other 
of the person. Uh, it's probably one of the biggest boons to law enforcement to come along in, in a long time, wouldn't you say? Yeah, for, uh, year, yeah, for years, uh, when you would recover a partial latent print, uh, it would just remain within a file, and if you were lucky enough that the homicide detectives would come up with a suspect, you would look at their card. But even at that, sometimes the uh, amount of print that you had was so small uh, it was impossible to match up. Now, uh, this has been such a great boon to law enforcement that it's uh, Interestingly it's enough, we have one of, a couple of our guys who have been going through all the old case jackets, and they've actually, I think, if I'm not mistaken, they, they've um, gotten the, uh, the largest amount of, of comparisons from APHIS of uh, local police departments. Um, and they should be very proud of their efforts, but also, um, boy, that's one of the, that's a computer I'd like to have. Huh? <laughs> but uh, it is, it is, and they do an excellent job at searching those things, so it really does work. Steve, are we... Um, we have a lot more to cover. Okay. Uh, we, we don't have a terrible amount of time, but let me ask you this. Once the photography and um, marking of evidence is, uh, is done, uh, what would be our next step? Now that we've kind of identified what all the items are that uh, are going to, ha- uh, you know, that we're going to take. One thing that I think is important to mention, if we we work our way back to the table, and I'm going to go over I'm going to go over this evidence on the table and and answer your question in a moment. But this cigarette in particular, what seemed uh, unusual about this scene, there appears to be two different brands of cigarettes. And on this one in particular, there's the lipstick that I mentioned earlier. Well, in this one in particular, we would assume that that's uh, hers based on the lipstick. However, we would still treat it as, as, as evidence. But let's take another cigarette butt, and we can check that cigarette butt for DNA evidence. Um, if you look down here at the end of this cigarette, this could be checked for a PCR or RFLP. Uh, which are DNA tests. The uh, first one, the PCR test, uh, could find uh, a 1 in 10. I think the odds are 1 in 10. It could range all the way up to a million. And the RFLP uh, test, if it's done the, to the fullest extent, could rule to go into the tens of millions to rule out suspects. So we are definitely going to collect these cigarette butts and have them checked for DNA. Now, to answer your question, as we start collecting this evidence and labeling it, we're going to uh, take this evidence and process it. Some's going to be processed here in the crime scene, and other evidence is going to be brought back to the Bureau of Forensics, where we process it in a laboratory setting. Um, in particular, the cup was processed with uh, powders, and I'll hold the cup up, and where you see the dark uh, colors, that is latent, those are latent fingerprints. So uh, we've successfully found some latents here. We don't know who these latents belong to. Again, we'll rule out everybody in the room and focus in on wherever that leads us. There appears to be some hot dog wrappers that are on the table. Now, these hot dog wrappers would be taken back to the, the laboratory setting, and a ninhydrin or a silver nitrate spray would be applied to these. And if the light's hitting it right, you'll see a purple discoloration, uh, purple color here, those again are latent fingerprints. I'll show you a chart in just a moment. The cup here, again, was processed uh, with dusting powders. Again, where you see the concentrated uh, dark color, that's a latent impression. The hat, we're not sure that it's his. We collect a hat, we could have hairs. pulled off that for trace fibers, try to link that up again. On this cup, in particular, there looks like there's a tea bag. Now, this tea bag, the end of the tea bag, could be processed. You Typically, when you hold a tea bag, it's with your fingers. A person touched, there's a transfer. Again, the lipstick, it's probably hers. We can't rule it out. Again, all these items would be processed. The drugs would be collected. This note here, we could have the, uh, this collected, too. This, there's no pen. I, I, I cannot find a writing instrument in this crime scene, which, to me, is, you know, is unusual. It's indicative. Somebody came in, took the pen uh, when they left. 
Again, if we go down to Annie's feet, we have a Asbury Park Press, several of them. The most recent date is today's date. The detectives can track down when that delivery was made, whether or not it was picked up at the grocery store, and we can at least rule out uh, that the time of death took place before then with a good, with good uh, reasonable thought. I have here, also if we come back to me, the crime scene sketch. We alluded to that earlier. The computer system, we can sketch this by hand. We can go back to the Bureau of Forensics. We can enter this information into computer. This is the other parts of the house. And we can generate this, and we can blow this up two or three times for court presentation. Bear with me one more moment. Drop this over here. This is a latent fingerprint, which was retrieved from the cup. It was photographed, and we enlarged it. And this would be used as a court display in which we would find a suspect, and we could make the comparisons over the various points of minutia, which is the terminology used in the fingerprint examination. Over here, I have some sterile swabs, cotton swabs. You use these for the blood swabbings or fluids. I number them. We keep them separate, of course, but we're doing this for the show, to show everybody things. We use distilled water. We apply distilled water to the tip of the cotton swab, and we would take this. We'd walk it over. We'll go down to the head for now. To use this as an example, and we could swab the blood. We would take a second swab, and we would use it as a control. And we would do that with all the blood swabs, especially these ones that lead out away from the body. All the spent cartridges that we saw earlier, either the 9 millimeter or the 40 caliber, they could be collected, they will be collected, and they can be fumed with cyanoacrylate fuming esters, and hopefully some fingerprints would be developed from when the person took the 9 millimeter cartridge and inserted that into the clip. The knife on Annie's neck would be collected, and that would be processed also. And if we still have some time, we could just go over wrapping up the, uh, the body and preparing it for transport by the medical examiner's office. Sure, please. Uh, sure. Go right ahead. The bodies, as they, as they lie, the evidence would be collected. Uh, the gun would be decocked and collected and placed into an evidence bag. The medical examiner's office removal service would respond to the scene, and their responsibility is to take the bodies and bring them to the medical examiner's office, which is located in Freehold, New Jersey, where a post-mortem examination or an autopsy would be performed. The bags are used and are placed over both hands and both feet so that if there was a struggle and there was any uh, hair or skin or fibers present on the hands, they would fall into the bag and the contents of the bag could be examined at a later date. What we didn't bring with us tonight is the alternate light source, which uh, we use on homicide scenes, which would uh, reveal any type of trace uh, fibers by using alternate uh, light frequencies and also seminal fluids and blood, uh, these type of things. We would get some fluorescent type of uh, reaction which, in other words, it would stand right out. We will be able to go over to it and take the swabs, as I stated earlier. And if we go back up to Annie's head, uh, for recreating a crime scene, again, using a California case, when we saw that animation on TV, the reconstruction, the way they get that information for the reconstruction is by these blood splatters. The blood splatters, if you uh, study the science of it, they indicate where the blows came from 
and where the uh, blood is being splattered from. If you took a hammer, if we come back over to the table, if we took a hammer and we held it in our hand and we hit the victim in the head with the hammer, the victim would start to bleed. As we pull that hammer back, the blood begins to splatter up and splatter down. You can actually almost count the different, count the number of blows by the number of splatters up and down. And I believe the California case, they focused a lot on the way the body movements, whether or not one or multiple people could have committed the crime. Any other ideas uh, that we want to focus in on as far as the collection uh, I, I or versus processing? I think that's probably pretty much it, Steve. Uh, probably what we need to do is, uh, I don't, we're going to take uh, one call from uh, Eric, and then I think, are we going to take a short break after that? Oh, okay. Hang on. Eric? Hi. How are you? Hi, how are you doing? Good. Um, uh, I just would like to know, um, a few years ago, uh, I know with the, in the law enforcement now with the new equipment that they have, um, I would like to know if the investigators still use the triangulation system in a crime scene uh, after they collect all the evidence. Do they still do that? Okay. Uh, Glenn? Yes, we do. Uh, when we're, one of the things, you know, Steve was kind of rushed up there. He's trying to give a lot of information in a short period of time. When uh, we do process a crime scene, one of the things we do is uh, do crime scene sketching. And to locate items within the crime scene, it's necessary to triangulate. And how we do that is to measure items uh, from two or three different permanent locations so that if we had to, we could go back and actually place that item uh, back in the same exact location so that we could show it again so that it can be documented in a crime scene sketch. Hmm. So that's still a very good system to use, though. Yeah, it's, it's, it's tried and true. Yeah, <laughs> re really, the only other way to, uh, to actually locate items within a crime scene, which we've uh, done in the past, if we were out in a large field or something where there's nothing permanent and there's only trees or things that could fall over, uh, we could use the uh, global positioning satellites uh, and we call the health department out and they have these readers that uh, give us a pretty close uh, location within 15 feet. And uh, it is triangulation, but it's triangulation off satellites in outer space. So we do use that also. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. Eric, thank you for your call and thanks for watching. Thank you. The, uh, Believe it or not, folks, we're running down our time on a show. And uh, I have a couple of notes before we uh, end up going off the air. Uh, first off, I want to thank Glenn Myers and Steve Padula for coming here and, and helping us out and throwing this crime scene together in a hurry for us. also want to thank Dave Casey, our uh, victim, who can now come back to life, if you so desire. Dave, did you fall asleep? No. Okay. And uh, what... Uh, he was uh, kind enough to come over and, and be our victim for us, so we certainly appreciate that. Also, I hope that this show was somewhat uh, educational for you and, uh, and somewhat enlightening uh, in the light of the things that you see on TV and, uh, and everything else. Uh, sometimes it's a little confusing, and uh, some, uh, some defense attorneys have a tendency to try to confuse the jury, so we hope we brought a little bit of clarity to you. Uh, for myself and my guests, uh, thank you for tuning in to NJ Law. Please tune in again next time, and uh, God bless and take care of yourselves and be good to each other, please.